national boards that focus on education and social change. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce Sonia. Thank you so much, John. I know there's not enough water falling out of the sky, but I would like to ask if there can be water for our uh, for our experts because we want to keep you guys hydrated so you can um, But let me start by introducing uh, the panel. Steve Clark is the Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration at NASA Science Mission Director. He serves as the agency's interface between the NASA Mission Doc, uh, Directors, the scientific community, and other external stakeholders in developing a, a, a strategy to enable and integrate approach for robotic and human exploration within NASA's exploration campaign. Dr. Mary Lynn, with an E, Dittmar, is President and CEO of the Coalition for Deep Space Exploration, an industry trade group supporting human exploration, science, commerce, and American leadership in space. Under her leadership, the coalition has grown from, from five companies to more than 70 over the past four years, and is a recognized source for policy, technical, and business information in the aerospace and defense. Brian Whitley is the Director of Civil Space Policy for the National Space Council. Prior to the detail at the National Space Council, Brian was the Deputy Systems Integration Manager in the Exploration Mission Planning Office at NASA's Johnson Space Center. His primary responsibility was to lead mission design and architecture activities for future human space exploration projects. And Lon Levin is president and CEO of GeoShare, a subsidiary of Lockheed Martin. Lon is the co-founder of Exxon Satellite Radio and has over 30 years experience starting and developing new space ventures. He's a co-founder of the Neil Space Science Institute, which we'll tell us about shortly. You are our other panelist and other moderator, so we're gonna take questions throughout this conversation. So when you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll get you, um, I will just say your words much louder uh, because I don't think we have a microphone for you. for you. So we'll start with Steve. You have some slides and a presentation to go through. So we'll start with Steve and Karen. Okay, thank you, Sonia. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me here. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the aspects of what I'm responsible for. I'm gonna talk broadly about really the NASA uh, strategy for uh, returning to the moon. And then I'm going to also talk more about the commercial lunar payload services, which is particularly what I am in charge of um, within the science mission directorate. Um, so I, I know everybody has seen the Space Policy Directive 1, probably very familiar with it. Um, but this is really the charge uh, given to NASA uh, to um, lead an innovative and sustainable program of exploration. Uh, not only to return to the moon, but, but also to uh, also send humans to Mars as well. So a lot of people have asked me, and including, I'm, I'm on planes all the time, so why do we want to go back to the moon? We went back there, what, six times during the Apollo time frame. Well, so you'll see here, these, this is a uh, kind of a composite of both the South Pole on the left and the North Pole on the right of the moon, and those blue areas is water ice that's been detected in the permanently shadowed regions of the craters at both poles. Um, uh, various assets have given us this data, but primarily the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that has been in low lunar orbit for 10 years now and still operating well, has provided us some really significant data here that now tell us there are tons and tons of water ice um, in these permanently shadowed regions. We need to go there now and do the ground truth to find out exactly how hard is it to get to, how easy or hard is it to actually excavate, and then actually break it down into hydrogen and oxygen for use in in situ resource utilization. Um, that's the next step um, for us to live off planet. We want to be able to use ISRU. And we want to use the moon as a testing ground uh, before we send humans to Mars as well. So here's a picture of Mars. Uh, this is the Korolev crater on Mars. As you can see, there is significant water ice trapped in this crater. So if we can test out those systems to utilize uh, water ice on the moon and then go forward to Mars, we'll be able to use those same systems on Mars and hopefully use the resources that we find in situ or on the planet and not have to take everything with us when we go. So a little bit about the Artemis program. Um, Artemis is the uh, twin sister of Apollo, uh, obviously a nod to our, our uh, previous program, which was extremely successful. 
and she's the goddess of the moon in Greek mythology, so uh, it, was a, it was a good alignment with what we're doing with returning to the moon. Um, and as you know, we've been given the charge by the White House to return humans by 2024 to the South Pole, the first woman and the next man uh, to the South Pole region. And uh, so that's what we're working towards, but again, with an eye towards sending humans to Mars. So this is the phase one of the Artemis program, and please, if you have questions, um, stop me and ask. Um, certainly this can be, I like it when it's more interactive. Um, so you can see, we call this the swoosh chart within, within the agency. Um, you can see the Artemis missions that are uh, on, the, on the top swoosh, Artemis one being the first flight of SLS and Orion. Um, that will be um, unmanned at that point. And then Artemis II will be the first human crewed mission, right, of, of Orion. Um, and then leading up to Artemis III, which will be the first crewed mission to actually take a lander down to the surface of the moon. Now in between that, we're building a gateway, which will be basically the portal to return humans to the surface of the moon. And the, the first element of that is in the center top, and it's called the uh, <clears throat> power and propulsion element, which is PPE as we call it. It's a solar electric bus. It's a commercial bus that we have procured from Maxar Technologies. Uh, they are on contract and they are in the process now of developing this bus for us. Um, and we're looking to launch this in, in the 2022 timeframe. Um, and then we will build up what we call a, a kind of a minimal configuration gateway where we'll have <clears throat> basically a habitation module uh, for the crew to live in when they do go there with Orion before they transfer into the human lander to go down to the surface and then come back to. Um, we'll also be able to dock a logistics module onto that. And then of course the lunar lander system, HLS, human landing system will dock to the gateway. Along the bottom you'll see um, commercial lunar payload services. And I mentioned that when I first started. Um, the science mission directorate has brought on nine uh, providers to provide purely commercial lunar delivery services. NASA is buying a ride to the surface of the moon. Uh, we don't own the lander hardware. We don't own the launch vehicle. Um, we are buying those services from these commercial companies to provide us a ride for our science instruments and our technology demonstration payments. So um, you'll see it's kind of scattered across between the 2019 and 24 timeframe. Um, the first two deliveries are set for July of 2021. And we uh, anticipate having a cadence of two deliveries per year. Um, so we anticipate having numerous deliveries to the surface of the moon and not just the South Pole region. Um, we want to we want to be able to go to anywhere on the moon, the poles, the mid-latitudes, the far side, because there is significant science to be done um, all over the surface of the moon. And then you'll see in the middle on the surface, we move up to the large scale cargo lander, uh, which we'll be looking at to take larger payloads to the surface of the moon, not just science instruments, but also to support the human missions as well. And then you'll see in the 2024 timeframe, uh, the human return mission on the right. The key to this is, if you see the mix, is that humans and robotics are going to be working in collaboration with this return to the moon. Um, there, there are so many different science investigations that can be done through robotics, but also you need that human intuition and intelligence to be able to go to the moon and um, you can look through cameras and direct rovers and robotics to look at certain areas, but to have a human actually be able to walk out there during the EVA and pick up a, a sample or look over to say, hey, we haven't seen this before. Um, you could, we've learned that from the Apollo astronauts that walked on the moon. Um, Jack Schmidt talks about that all the time. So we're gonna return to the moon with more of a, a robotic and human collaboration. Phase two is building the capabilities for the first uh, human Mars mission. The CLIPS opportunities, as you can see, we will continue again to fly as many as two per year. Uh, we may be able to surge beyond that. Um, we'll, we'll have to see what the traffic um, and demand is. Um, and keep in mind, again, I said NASA is uh, buying a ride. We are not the only customers. Um, we want to be one of many customers with these commercial lunar payload services. And in fact, on the first two delivery uh, missions, we already know we are not the only customers that those companies have signed up. 
Um, and then as you move to the right, you'll see um, a, a the Artemis support mission and, a, uh, and actually a, a just a, it's a concept of a pressurized rover. Um, we're going to use the moon as a test bed <clears throat> to do Mars analogs, um, to do the testing of these systems on the surface of the moon a lot closer here to home before we venture to Mars with the first uh, humans. So we'll be testing those systems out and <clears throat> evolving those systems for the Mars environment. Uh, the, the moon environment actually is going to be more harsh than the Mars environment because it's airless. And so the temperature gradients between the shadows and the sunlit regions are huge. Uh, Mars still has somewhat of an atmosphere look. And so um, the, the transient, the temperature transients aren't nearly like they are on the moon. So we'll actually be testing in a more uh, hostile environment. So here's a little bit more about the commercial lunar payload services. Um, these are the nine companies that were awarded contracts in November of last year. We're almost coming up on a year now, it's hard to believe. Um, and they are on what I call a catalog. So we, will, we typically will issue, like we did uh, earlier this year, delivery task orders to these nine companies. And they can choose to bid or not bid back to us on uh, where we want to go on the moon and what we want to deliver from a mass and power standpoint. And so um, we awarded the first delivery task orders in May of this year to Astrobotic and Intuitive Machines. Um, we did have a third one that we had awarded. It was Orbit Beyond. And uh, shortly after awarding um, the task order, um, the Orbit Beyond uh, CEO came to us and uh, revealed that there were some issues going on with a licensing agreement on uh, the actual design of the lander and where it was going to be built. Um, in the end, uh, we both agreed that it, it, it was uh, at best to just terminate that task order. Um, Orbit Beyond is still on the CLIPS contract, um, and they, they have already acquired uh, different partners, so we expect them to be providing proposals back to us on the next delivery task orders. Um, I already talked about the cadence of two per year. Um, we're actually towards the end of what I call an on-ramp. Um, what do I mean by an on-ramp? Well, we're looking to bring on additional capability to the CLIPS contract. And what we want to do is bring on what we call enhanced landing capability. And what I mean by that is larger landers that can deliver heavier payloads to the surface of the moon sooner than later. And so um, at the end of this process, um, I anticipate bringing on additional companies to the CLIPS contract to be able to bid to those task orders uh, that I described earlier. And uh, we expect to be able to award uh, in November, so uh, stand by, you'll be hearing about that next month. So um, what we want to do from a science perspective, I am from the Science Mission Directorate, so um, we do work very closely with the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate and the Space Technology Mission Directorate um, because we want to fly a combination of payloads to the surface of the moon. Um, but we also want to conduct science, because science really is the primary driver for going back. Um, we're going to do it through those CLIPS landers that I talked about. We also plan on rovers. Mobility is the key to a much broader area of exploration, not just from humans, but from a robotic standpoint, so that you can take multiple data sets uh, for months. Um, and if, if you eventually bring online, say, a, a, you know, a nuclear-powered rover like we do on Mars, then you can row for years. Um, so we're going to be using landers and rovers to both poles, but as I mentioned earlier, we want to go all over the surface of the moon. Um, and that's where the nonpolar landers and rovers are um, uh, mentioned here. There is some orbital data that we can still acquire. Um, not only are we going to do lunar science, but there are other science data that we can acquire, um, such as in low lunar orbit, um, heliophysics, is constantly studying the solar wind, the high energetic particles that come off the sun all the time, and how that solar wind interacts with the Earth's atmosphere. Being around the moon, we can get additional data uh, of how that solar wind is interacting with the moon. We already know that when the solar wind impacts the, solar, the, the lunar surface, um, it actually frees up uh, water molecules that are in underneath the regolith. We've seen it happen with instruments, even from the Apollo instruments, that were left on the moon. Um, so we're going to continue to want to get orbital data as well from various uh, from the various science aspects. And then I mentioned the in situ resource utilization as well. And with that, um,
I'm more than happy to answer any questions or turn it back over. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. much. So if you don't mind, I'm going to do mine sitting down. Um, so first, thanks to the Potomac Institute for the invitation to be here. Really appreciate that. Um, it's a great panel, so it should be a fun afternoon. And I see some familiar faces in here. Hello. Uh, from we do a, uh, The Coalition does a Congressional Space Studies series course here um, every year. It's about nine modules where we do space basically soup to nuts, so it's good to see it's good to see people here from familiar faces for that. I'm going to take a step back a little bit and talk about the why question. Um, it's the one that leads space policy folks to kind of roll their eyes, um, but I do want to, I want to just touch on it a bit. Um, so in my role, I, I'm the uh, CEO of the Coalition for Deep Space Exploration, as we discussed, but previously I was on the Human Space Flight Committee for the National Academy. It's actually then the National Research Council. And we were charged in 2012 to do a study essentially looking at the plans for NASA's future exploration programs, specifically focused on human, although not to exclude science. Um, and what we were charged to do was essentially try to answer that why question. And not just the why question, but why, where, a little bit of how. And so the very first thing we did is we sat down as a committee, and it was a very large committee. It was composed um, quite thoughtfully by the academies, as many of the committees are, to place people on it from a broad array of disciplines who would almost from the get-go disagree. And the point of doing that is to encourage debate. It's to encourage various disciplinary approaches and to, de to encourage people who have, in some cases, strong feelings um, about the topic to be able to speak out and there are technical panels that then support the inquiry that's sort of developed by the committee and that's how it proceeds. And the very first thing we did was we talked about the where, but we really couldn't talk about the where without talking about the why. So first I'll talk about the where. What we asked ourselves was what was foreseeable within maybe not our lifetimes, but foreseeable given the technology development that existed when we were convened and also it was predictable. I mean, you know, you could kind of see it coming. And what we determined was that Mars was, for the foreseeable future, what we called the horizon destination for human spaceflight. And we looked across all of the human spaceflight agencies and interests across the globe and found out pretty much everybody was talking about the same thing. Um, that was broadly seen as the ultimate destination, maybe not the ultimate <coughs> ultimate in terms of the development of the human species, but certainly foreseeable in the next several decades. And then the question became, okay, then how do we get there? And the title of the report is called the Pathways to Exploration Report, shorthand title, because what we developed was a series of pathways, means to get there, which is essentially take stepping stones. And this was similar to a flexible path idea that had actually been proposed earlier in a another study that was chaired by Norm Augustine. And in the study, what we did was we looked at the means to get there in terms of if you take this road, are you higher risk? If you take that road, are you at lower risk? And what we determined was if you hit every destination between here and Mars, which is essentially we're going to go from here to an asteroid, we go from the asteroid to the moon, we're going to go from the moon to one of the moons of Mars, we're going to go from one of the moons of Mars to Mars, in other words, several stops along the way, developing missions and capabilities to enable you to do each one of those, you would buy down risk because you're gonna be learning an awful lot at each one of these stops. Imagine that you're taking a really, really long road trip, okay? Really long, decades long, okay? And you will be learning a lot at each one of the stops, so you buy down risk. But it's gonna be the most expensive, and it's gonna cost the most, no question, because there's a lot of missions involved in that pathway. We also looked at from Earth to an asteroid to Mars. We looked at Earth direct to Mars. Okay, we looked at a lot of different things. And where we ended up is we couldn't make a recommendation saying absolutely positively this is the way you should go. But most of the committee was, I don't think I'm talking too far out of school, most of the committee was favoring go to the moon first. And so one of the things I want to address is that NASA's gotten a lot of flack, frankly, over the last few years because it has whiplash all the time as an agency. Um, it's directed to go to Mars, it's then directed to go to the moon, then it's directed to go to Mars. Okay. But if you look at policy and legislation that's been written by Congress, 
essentially has been remarkably consistent since the mid-2000s. And what it really says is that NASA is charged to explore beyond Earth, okay, to include Moon, Mars, and other destinations. And so the report turned out, kind of to our surprise, to be consistent with what the legislation was stating. We didn't set out that way. We were an honorary group. If we had not agreed, you would have known it. Okay, but basically that's how we ended up. And the use of the moon as a way to learn how to live in a different place. The use of the moon as a way to develop technologies, some of which will be applicable to Mars and some of which will not be applicable to Mars. Okay, but to develop new technologies and, and to figure out what does it mean to be human beings living, working, doing science, doing exploration, developing commerce in time, okay, on another, on another body, what does that really mean? And what is that gonna teach us about ourselves? So the report ended up coming out in 2014. It's very long. It reads like it was written by a committee, I must say. Um, unfortunately, but there it is, okay? I recommend the first chapter if you don't want to slog through the entire thing, because the first chapter was co-written by our chairs and they did a great job of trying to capture pretty much what's in the report, but it lays out the logic for doing this. And as for the why, which is where I started, the why is multi-headed. Certainly science, certainly development of technology, certainly maintaining an industrial base, which I represent, which is hugely important. NASA's work in science and exploration could not proceed without its industry partners. The systems that you hear a lot about, which I'll mention briefly for human exploration, include Orion, which is the next generation crew vehicle, which is not your daddy's Apollo. It is, well, you wouldn't expect it to be, right? It's a bunch of years later, all right? It's very, very capable, okay? It can handle journeys into deep space beyond the moon. It has an extraordinary amount of autonomy. I also um, was in charge of integrating systems and subsystems for the development of the space station for a long time, and I'm telling you, there's a lot of autonomy and a bunch of different means, okay, for executing that autonomy. It can return crews that are relatively disabled, okay, and still get them back safely. Uh, it has an amazing heat shield. There's just a ton of things that it does that are, that are just extraordinary. The space launch system, which is gonna be the most powerful rocket ever, or since the Saturn V, it depends on how you measure it, okay? So, but it's gonna be extremely powerful once you have the upper stage on it, capable of carrying a whole lot of stuff to deep space destinations. And then the ground systems which are being developed, which everybody ignores, okay? But the IT infrastructure that's necessary to manage all the data, okay, that's coming in um, is extraordinary also. So those are the big three. But there's a ton of other vendors, and, and Steve mentioned some of these folks, some of the commercial, Folks, this is not happening, okay, in the way that it happened for Apollo. Apollo was great, served a purpose, okay, at that time historically. We have all kinds of people now that are interested in developing technologies and capabilities and trying to figure out where they can offer goods and services for profit, fun and profit. I'm also an entrepreneur, I love fun and profit, okay. Um, a lot of different ways to do that. And so as a result, what we're doing is seeing an explosion of starts okay, in the development of technologies and new approaches to doing things, both on the traditional government programs and in the new space world. And so it's a very exciting period of time to do this, and that's a part of the why. The other part of the why is essentially leadership. The U.S. has been out in front in space, okay, for 60 years, and there's no way that we want to see that. That's a price we have already paid. It's an investment we have already made. And shame on us if we don't continue to capitalize that and advance it. And then the other reason is, frankly, the human spirit. And we laid it out, okay, in the report. Aspiration, inspiration, these are very real things. There's a lot of data supporting it, All right? So those are the whys. I'm going to stop. Thanks. Well, fortunately, um, Marilyn covered everything I was going to say, so no. Um, <laughs> She did cover a lot of the, the waterfront on some of the things I want to touch on, um, including the why, um, because that, you know, like she said, it's it's it can be uh, getting down into something that we think we, we intuitively understand, but then the why really explains perhaps why we haven't really gone to deep space exploration since Apollo, um, and why it's such a such a, a difficult thing. And so I, I commend to you um, a speech. I, I like to mention this because it really inspired me um, to think about this differently. 
that Dr. Griffin gave, the former NASA administrator in 2007. He talked about the real reasons, acceptable reasons of exploration. And what Mira Lynn just outlined actually covers a lot of front of those. You know, the acceptable reasons are, are the ones that are pretty obvious, like, you know, scientific discovery, economic benefit, which is like technology, industrial base, uh, national security. Even though, um, you know, it's a civil exercise, it's something that's vital to national, you know, prominence, national security. It's something that, you know, was the key reason during the Apollo uh, era, why we, did, why we did it back then, so leadership in space. But the real reasons are beyond that. It is the human spirit, it's the pioneering spirit that um, is, is, is part of us. So when we talk about it, we usually don't, you know, we really think that we're going to get the, the, to the core of why we explore. It, it's beyond that. It's, it's, it's something that's built into our DNA as the administrator, uh, the current administrator, I like to say. So one of the things that we spend a lot of time thinking about is how can we get this thing off the ground? Why, why is it that we have these fits and starts and we don't get going? Um, you know, and I think if you look at your history books, um, you'll remember that you know this is not the, the, the first time we've tried to do a Moon to Mars program. Um, we tried to do one in Bush One. Um, it's called the um, um, uh, Space Exploration Initiative, and and basically um, it, it, it was dead on arrival because um, the price tag was too high. We saw a price tag, we saw it, and was, and and the Congress was like, uh, no, take take that back. I don't I don't want any part of that. Um, the second time they thought they learned that lesson. And there's a vision for space exploration. It's like, well, we can, we can, we're not going to put this big price tag out there. But then it started coming out like, oh, well, we don't have enough. So the Augustine Commission came back and said, this is becoming really, really too much more than we thought it was going to take, and it's taking too long. You know, uh, why don't we just just cancel it? And so, basically, you know, our aspirational goals became undefined or un, un, unmeasured. Um, and that's really, I think, the the idea behind what's going on in this administration. So, representing the National Space Council. Representing, you know, the Space Policy Directive One, which, you know, actually, let me flip back. Steve, Steve kindly provided this, this for for me. Um, uh, th this statement is is really the cornerstone of, of, of what we're tr trying to do, and this, there was a lot of thought into this in this paragraph as to what what that means. And then the key words I want to focus on um, is the word sustainable. So that appears um, the, the fifth let word on there. Um, innovative and sustainable. So I'll, I want to kind of really harp on those two words in, in detail. And sustainable, you know, if you look at, at a definition, um, Webster says, capable of being maintained at length without interruption or weakening. I have to say our space program hasn't really done a great job of that. Um, you know, even even as, at our highest peak of the Apollo program, um, we left Saturn rockets just rusting on, on the ground after it was done. Why? It was too expensive. So we move on to something else. We move on to the shuttle, space station, great achievements. Shuttle's flown over and over and over again. Shuttle's not flying anymore. You know, we're, we're not doing that anymore. Space station is not going to live forever. I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come to an end. So when we say capable of maintaining link without interruption or weakening, we don't mean that those same systems have to live forever. We do mean that we have to find ways to, to, to backfill, to, to keep the to exploration vision going. And so to me, sustainability really means um, that the corollary is, is in, in a world where you don't have unlimited funds, um, affordability. You, know, you basically are making these things easier and more commonplace to do. And so um, that's why when we, we have this statement about you know, how we're leading this program, that's why the other two part, parts of that sentence come into play. So innovative and sustainable program of exploration with commercial and international partners. So the word commercial is thrown out a lot. You probably hear it a lot. Um, you know, does this mean we're saying that there's this grand commercial marketplace out there where people are going to make billions of dollars doing space exploration? Probably not for a while. Um, you know, the saying goes, you want to become a millionaire in space, you start as a billionaire. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not a highly lucrative, you know, field, um, but they will get there, right? We'll, we'll get there. But in the meantime, what we mean by commercial, we mean we want entrepreneurs to take, take risks, to, to, to experiment, to, to make things, to innovate, to, be, to make things um, you know, easier to do and have a, have a marketplace of options for, for exploring. We don't want to be in this single source kind of, kind of world that we have been in through Apollo and, and space shuttle and stations. So really what we're, what we're pushing for is, is an economy of, of, of scale and space. So then I, I did want to talk a little bit about, about the what and that gets back down into the statement again. You know, what, what are we doing? Um, in the blue it says the United States will leave the return of humans to the moon for long-term exploration and utilization followed by human missions to Mars and other destinations. So why, how is this different from Apollo? You know, when we, um, you, know, you, could, you could argue, you know, 
the Apollo missions were like the first pioneers who came over the, the Atlantic. We just had Columbus Day. You know, came over the Atlantic and, and landed and, 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 and saw it and then went back. Uh, or you could say it's like in Antarctica where we, we, we went there and then 50 years later we finally returned again. Um, you know, the moon isn't like a place we just, you know, oh, we visited there once. Let's just let it sit there now. You know, we, don't, we don't need it anymore. You know, it's, it's a place where we can use, we can live, we can prosper on. We can take into our economic sphere. And so the idea that the, the been there and done that on the moon is, is really a kind of short-sighted way of looking at it. But I think it is proper to look at it in terms of the lens, like of Mary Lynn outlined, as to where we're trying to go. We want deep space exploration to continue. So we don't want to stop on the moon. So it's not like, you know, we go to the moon and, and, and we don't use it. We, we want to use it for what we need to do for Mars. And so that's, I think, the final point I want to leave you with is that, um, you know, there's been a lot of studies like the Pathways Report that really, you know, nailed that, you know, pretty, pretty well. I mean, there's some great quotes in there. I think I have some of them. Um, you know, basically, um, you know, lunar surface missions are a good analogy for Mars sur surface operations. Um, you know, the ones that follow the first explorers, the ones who profit from that accomplishment, um, we should look at our lack of interest in the lunar surface. Um, and frankly, you know, if humans are eventually to land and operate for extended periods on Mars, the capabilities required for Mars are best developed and tested on the lunar surface. So, could we go, you know, like, like some folks have, you know, talked about straight to Mars? Probably, if, if, all, if all the stars align, you got the budgets together, you got the long-term vision, you, you did all that. But what, what would that be? That'd probably be another like Apollo, where we went, it's too expensive to maintain, we do it once, we come back, yay, mission accomplished, sign up, done. That's not what we want. We, we want exploration to continue. We want to thrive in space. We want to become part of our economic sphere. And for all those reasons that I mentioned at the beginning, um, which are both economic and um, uh, science-oriented, um, but as well as um, national security-driven, um, leadership in space is, is, is very important. We don't want to cede that um, to other nations. Um, it's a mark of a great nation. And finally, you know, because it's truly inspirational, I want to be able to look at, uh, up at the moon. Um, the administrator this morning was given a uh, was a hearing and, and, and talked a little bit about this. You know, we have now more people alive in the U.S. who weren't alive for the Apollo landings than than not. And and that's hopefully not going to be our legacy. We're going to have a legacy where we continue to reach out deep into space. That takes um, investment, it takes, it takes a measured, um, calculated risk, which is really what the 2024 is all about. That, that goal is to say, here's a measurable goal, a step that we can achieve, and it's into the political horizon, we can actually achieve this. And then we can move on to the next goal, and the next goal, and the next. But if we don't put an achievable goal in front of us, we'll never achieve that long-term goal that we really want to get to. So, thanks. One. Thank you, Sonia, and thank you very much for uh, having me and the rest of the panel here. Um, I'm going to uh, speak fast because I have to catch a plane for business in going to Istanbul. What great timing, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not going to negotiate. It will take you longer to get to Dallas. Uh, you know, that's, that's, and, and probably more dangerous. Um, uh, okay, so I just have one slide. This is just uh, to give you a synopsis of what Milo's about, but we're really going to talk about it. I'm going to talk fast so that we can get to questions, uh, which is the best part always anyway. So uh, the Milo Space Science Institute, it's a collaborative uh, between um, Arizona State University, Lockheed Martin, and GeoShare. GeoShare is a separate subsidiary of Lockheed, um, and GeoShare has actually been helped driving this. The idea is this, is that we uh, want to enable as many scientists, engineers, and students throughout the world, including many of them who don't have much uh, experience, to design, develop, and conduct deep space missions. Um, the goal is to build a global consortium of MILO members to self-fund deep space uh, efforts. Essentially, we're trying to build a different model on how to do space science. There are three trends that we're trying to address. Um, <clears throat> the first trend is there is much more compelling space science that can be done than is being done. With regard to NASA, who we love, and obviously Lockheed and GeoShare, and I was in the NAC for 10 years, we have a wonderful relationship. But here's the reality. The reality is with NASA, nine out of 10 space science missions simply aren't being done. And this is just at NASA. And NASA is the biggest agency in the world, by far. And the United States would do the most amount of space science. And that's, by the way, to our credit. But you know, a lot of other countries are looking at us, and they see the great benefit of space. And what we're seeing is the proliferation of space agencies all throughout the world. We're, we're, just, we're talking to 36, and there are more of them. Every day, 
every year, not every day, but every week, every month, there's another space agency that is being formed. And the reason why is the nations are seeing that they want to be part of the worldwide space family because it helps the economy, it inspires, and it does all the things that it's done for the United States. It's done a worldwide effort. We want to take advantage of that. And the third thing that's very related to that is that there are more and more students, scientists, professors who are actually um, getting into aerospace, aerospace engineering, and space science. Again, for the same reasons. It's inspirational, it's wonderful to research and to learn, but there aren't, still aren't as many opportunities to do space science as there should be, and relative to all these needs, all these space agencies, all these students, all the professors. So we came up with a new model. It's called the Milo Space Science Institute. Again, a collaborate, collaboration. Uh, Arizona State University leads it, but Lockheed Martin and Geo share there. And the reason why Arizona State and Lockheed partner is because Arizona State, they're the ones signing off on the compelling science. And Lockheed Martin's there because when people are going to give money into this institute, I think they want to make sure that it's going to work. And when Lockheed's involved, things work. So Milo Space Science Institute, the way we address it is by assuring three things. First, the science must be world class. Jim Bell, a great scientist at Arizona State University, as well as others, they're the ones who sign off, they decide on what's the great science, what, what at least the ones are going to do. Secondly, time emissions. We're only looking to do science in the neighborhood, which is essentially Mars, Moon, near Earth, near -earth objects, and, um, and Venus. Those are the four that, that we look at right now. There may be more in the future, but we're trying to get things done within five years. And then the third part is that it's least, least cost affordable missions. We're going to use heritage technology. We're going to um, split the costs, among others. And, and the three that I have up there, I'll tell you just the rough cost of those so you can get a sense that these really are doable missions that people can participate in throughout the world. Um, and what we're hoping for is that as many people worldwide, as many agencies, um, can participate in these efforts and, and create a truly worldwide collab collaborative effort. We've only been doing this for a year, and already we're, the numbers are we're engaged with 60 universities, 36 space agencies, 24 government organizations, and 30 companies. And we'll be having some announcements at the ISC, which is coming up next week, where you can see all the progress that we've made, and, and we, we're making progress all the time. By the way, I should point out that um, ESA likes us, NASA, is very much uh, in our corner. And in part, the reason why NASA likes us is because NASA views us as developing a farm system for them, like in baseball, where there are new scientists and there are new universities that can participate in space science, but maybe can't compete, actually, in some of these programs. But if we can give them an opportunity to compete or to learn how to do it, um, then they can elevate their, their status uh, th throughout the world. Um, I just want to talk quickly about how people get involved. It's all different levels. They can build a sensor. They can just get the original science. They can um, collaborate with other universities and design something, but not necessarily build. We're trying to provide all opportunities for different entities. And again, um, it's got to be compelling science. We have to be able to do it quickly, and we have to be able to um, make sure that people can participate. So just to go down the three missions there, I'm going to go up first so you can get a sense. Neo shares may be the best Explain, um, the best way to explain Milo Space Science Institute. Um, we're planning on going uh, in 2024 to uh, launch six small spacecraft to between six to 10 near Earth objects, and we're gonna characterize them, we're gonna study them. But as you can imagine, you can build a spacecraft, you can build a part of a spacecraft, you can just get the science, you can be part of determining what's, what's, what asteroids or other things that we go to. And anyone can participate, and the petition, participation levels, um, you can put in as much money as you, as you think is appropriate for what you have. So the whole project costs $200 million. You can spread that across 20 agencies and 30 universities. You can imagine that you can split up enough cost that um, you can actually make it affordable for your particular entity. Uh, the next one is the Apophis uh, Pathfinder. In uh, 2029, 2029, the office is coming. Is that, is NASA sending a, a so NASA will be sending um, um, uh, something to uh, intercept Apophis and understand Apophis is a big asteroid coming that's going to be very close to Earth and it's big enough it's actually going to affect our tidal system. It can affect our tidal system. Um, um, it's going to come under the geostationary arc even closer than that. So it's coming. It's big. 
it's a way to study something that comes that close that could be a problem if it actually decides to hit us. Um, and so both uh, expression for um, planetary defense as well as, <clears throat> as well as just to understand asteroids, um, that's what NASA's doing. What we're planning on doing, we're only $60 million, is uh, we're going to go sooner, around the 24, 20, 2023, 2024 time frame, and um, send two small spacecraft, characterize, understand Apophis, and then help NASA and others who will be part of the bigger mission to get, uh, to get more information so that we're better informed for the mission. And the third one is a lunar lander that actually, Steve, you, you mentioned uh, the clips and all that, so Lockheed Martin is going up with one of the um, lunar landers, and what we're hoping is to include others of the universities and others on it to do their own space science uh, when they go. And in that one, uh, we can <coughs> charge uh, $1.3 million uh, per kilogram, and um, if someone has a, an effort that they want to do that's up to, let's say, 30 kilograms, to do math, it's $30 million to be part of to going to the moon and landing and doing space science. So I'm going to stop there. I hope that the different ideas that I presented, um, you can imagine what we can do. These are just three ideas and three ways we're going to do Milo. It's hopefully going to be duplicated and to go to your words, sustainable. I hope this becomes as sustainable as it can be. And by the way, let others duplicate it as well. We, we hope that Milo is not the only way uh, and the only model uh, of this and that others uh, start to do this too. So we can have more participation worldwide um, and uh, assure all the science that we want to get done gets done. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, why don't you remind you that you were able to ask questions throughout, so I don't want to hold you back, but I want to get started with uh, something that Mary and Mike were talking about, so having these fits and starts of success, and the U.S. was at the forefront of the success, and it seems to be waning. Is that the natural rhythm of things, or um, or am I misinterpreting what success is? Would you both like to get a little bit deeper? Mary Lynn? <laughs> yeah, that was a bit hard to the doctor. Yeah. Um, so, Government programs wax and wane. Um, they're generally sustained to some level, okay, but then sort of below that level they tend to wax and wane, and that's not just the space program. It's again, just look at the budget, um, and you'll see that. So that's one sort of reality. But the other thing is, I, I would actually disagree that our leadership is waning. Um, I think that we are at risk, however, of it waning. And so the the thing is, do you want to double down on your ability to move forward um, or not? And I believe very strongly that it's important for U.S. leadership and technology development and economic development and science and, and, and human aspiration um, for us to, to, to double down um, and, and continue. So I, the fits and starts piece is the vagaries of being a government agency that is driven in large part by political interest and consensus. And as we all know, and everybody in this room knows, um, consensus itself tends to wax and wane, right? There are a period of times where there is good consensus going forward with regard to space policy and, and funding, and then there are times where there's not good consensus going forward. And so we've seen a history uh, with regard to NASA, and in fact, with regard to administration change. I would like to point out, though, what I said earlier. If you go back to the 2005 Authorization Act for NASA, actually even before then, but certainly 2005, 2008, 2010, 2017, um, and the current drafts that are circulating at the moment, um, what you see is really remarkable consistency with regard to straightforward um, development of, of capabilities and goals, and I really, really want us to stop fighting about destinations. That's why I talked about, just go, okay? I talked about the Pathfinder report, let's just go, okay? I like what the current administration is doing with regard to the moon, but the other reason I brought this up is to say this is not purely a political perspective with regard to going to the moon. There's a lot of work that's been done um, on looking at why this is a good idea, and not just by the Pathfinder report. I mean, many, many reports for years earlier. Um, so, so I guess I do want to push back a little bit on well, your perception. And I appreciate that. The, if the reports are consistent, Yeah, and so just to, to pull on some things that Mary Lynn said, yes, we've been we've been consistent. I think the problem one of the problems from a history lesson here is that you know Apollo was really an anomaly. 
I mean, it was not, that's not the typical way you're going to see funding into the space program. So if we rely on Apollo model as, oh, this is the way it needs to be in the future, that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a mistake. Because that, that was a confluence of a political events and, and different activities that really led to a consistent um, approach. I mean, right after Nixon got in, in office, it was just two years later, he's canceling everything. Right, so it's, that was not a typical way of doing exploration. So we have to kind of come up with a new model. And one of the things that, though, that you know is, is different that we still need a, a piece. You know, one thing we need to learn from Apollo is urgency. So the problem is we're, we're kind of complacent now. Um, we're a little bit risk averse. We don't develop things very fast in government, and so as a result, we don't really see progress in ex exploration very quickly. And so that's that's the other thing we're really trying to, to put, push on by having commercial involved, by having competition, having deadlines. And no kidding deadlines. I mean, having worked at NASA for many years, um, you see this kind of like horizon just keeps you know slipping it, slipping away. Like we're never going to accomplish this. That's not that's not a good use of taxpayer dollars to to pump money into some mission that you're saying is going to happen. And you don't actually ever achieve it. Um, so that that has to change, and that's why these near term goals have to be brought forward. It doesn't mean that that vision <coughs> hasn't been changed. I mean, the edges have, have changed back and forth, and you have you know, political reasons not not to do to do the moon at, at certain times, but that. In my mind, I think is disappearing. You're hearing you know, pars bipartisan support for let's do the moon, let's do it well, then do Mars. Um, timing all those things can work itself out. Um, but in the end, if we don't if we don't have um, an urgency around that, it's just always you know, and sometime in the future. And that's why I worry about with Mars. Mars is always going to be 20 years away. We've said that you know, every every year. <laughs> just say it real quick. Um, but one thing is really important here is. When we talk about going to the moon to learn, okay, and develop some stuff on the moon, we really need to be serious about the fact that this is a learning ground, a proving ground, as it's been called, okay, to go to Mars. Um, otherwise, and now I'm talking as a systems engineer, okay, when you do design, you need to be thinking about the systems that you're developing and whether what, what you know, okay, at the time may be applicable to future missions. If you don't do that, then what ends up happening is a bunch of dead end development, and that is absolutely not what we need. So that's important to sort of keep that in the mix, and that's why I was really glad to see Mars come back into the discussion. Um, because as we think about this, there's going to be development for things that are specific to the moon, yes, but there needs to be development thinking about this as a larger picture, which is why I said I'm sick of destinations. So I'll stop now. Yeah. You know, my, um, yeah, one thing I wanted to bring up on this is the commercial aspect. You know, um, if you look at the Apollo model, and I agree with Ryan, um, that was really under different socioeconomic conditions, the objectives were different. There are a lot of underlying reasons why we did that as well. If you look at now today, the way technology um, has matured, and now NASA is actually relying more on the strengths of the commercial industry um, and engaging in different ways, such as CLIPS. Um, CLIPS is a new model. Um, to buy a ride and not NASA not being involved with the design of the lander uh, or the launch vehicle. Uh, and you know, Ryan mentioned about risk aversion. I mean, th we are accepting additional risk by buying a ride and not having that, you know, what we typically have had insight into all the subsystems of a, every piece of that lander. Um, we're not doing it. We're, we're actually accepting the fact that there are going to be um, successes, but there are going to be failures as well. I mean, we've seen now, right, um, two attempts at landing on the moon that have been unsuccessful. It's not easy. And we're seeing that even today with today's technology, it's not that easy. Uh, but we are going to see successes. And we're trying to jumpstart this commercial industry. And I think as we see that industry grow, I mean, these lander designs have been designed, um, they go back, a lot of them, to the Google X Prize days, where we had you know, investors basically putting money into these designs. Well, now we're seeing the fruition of these designs. And we're going to see some commercial successes out of this. And as they grow and their commercial base grows to go to the moon, um, with NASA not being the only customer, I think we're going to see a stronger space economy, I'll call it. We don't know what that looks like yet. Yes, it's going to take a little bit of time to establish. Um, but as you see the successes, we're going to see more and more commercial companies jump in on this. And I think we're going to see more services provided, not just to NASA, but other government agencies and other customers as well. So. I think it's a pretty exciting time, and I think it's a unique time, actually. Do you see more engagement from those partners, or do you feel a, a little bit like you don't get the control that you used to have, and you did allude to the fact that you, you had not decided to ever think it was happening, but if you give that up, do you get more engagement, and that's worth it? 
I think it's worth it. I'm, I'm an engineer as well, so I've learned to have to not ask too many questions, right? <laughs> working with the partners, but it's been a really interesting um, learning experience working with, in particular, Intuitive Machines and Astrobotic because they're the first two that are going to be delivering um, instruments and technology demonstration payloads for NASA to the surface. And we're learning how to work together. Um, and I can tell you, I mean, it's gone very well. Um, there hasn't been a big push for you know, NASA to say, well, we want more information and we want to go to every design review. Um, you know, that's not our job. And um, we, we are doing really well working with partners. They're learning about how to work with NASA. We're learning how to work with the commercial companies. And every company is going to have, just like NASA, everybody has their own culture. Right. And so we're going to learn how to work together with all of the various clips providers as, as we do things with them. So um, I think it's a really good experience even for the NASA culture as well, uh, because we're seeing a little bit of that shift now away from the traditional way to working with commercial partners in a different way. And we've seen it in other areas too, commercial crew, commercial cargo. Um, this is another different approach to it, you know, leveraging some of the lessons learned from there too. Great. First question. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. I think we've had a good uh, discussion so far. I encourage more questions. Um, one of the main reasons that we keep talking about going um, deep space is to really explore and to learn more science. Um, historically, we've had NASA has shared that information with the, the public. As we have commercial companies going, they will likely want to hold the information that they find to themselves. What do we have ways that we can? I know it's a relatively small community of space companies, so people talk and move between jobs, and so that's one way of information sharing. But um, as we move forward and we have commercial companies going and gathering their own information, how can we ensure that we as a society have access to the science and information that they're learning as well? Well, first let me talk about Milo, and then I can answer your question about commercial companies. But even before I do that, I do want to say your concept of risk. When you say that it's, things are riskier now, I think when uh, I think you have nine entities going to the moon, you're diversifying your risk. I'm not sure it's any riskier if you just analyze it. I understand not having as much control equals it feels riskier, but you do have your standards. You do say what's got to get done. You do give people money, and I think it's uh, the model seems to be working. You know, especially with like commercial crew and all that, and we have two different entities who are competing, and and you, you neck it down to more. So that's at least my perception. As a commercial guy, I know I'm coming from two different perspectives than you are, um, but I, I think if, if the analysis is done, I think it's less risky. Anyway, and your question now. So with Milo Space Science Institute, which is which is uh, a hybrid, and that is this is a private effort, but it's a not-for-profit, and it's coming out of a university. Now, the way science is generally done, those who put the money in, the universities and all that, they actually do get the science first. But the way it works in the world, generally speaking, at least in, in, in the uh, friendly countries, um, uh, once you do the science, you eventually release it to the public. However, there's got to be an incentive for scientists who are putting the money in, and the institutions who are putting the money in, to actually um, want to put the money in, and, and that's how they gain their prestige, and that's how they gain their, um, their notoriety, same thing, um, by getting that science first, putting the money, investing in the science, getting the science, and then doing the first experiments and the first understanding. Of it. It, it is how it's done today, generally speaking. However, eventually it does get released within a year or so. That's, that's how it's done. With regard to the private sector, now I speak with the private um, entrepreneur who's been doing this for many years, um, there's got to be an incentive for people to put all that money in to do the science. Just like drug companies put all the money into getting drugs and put hundreds of millions, billions of dollars sometimes just to develop a drug, they want to keep their science to themselves. However, they do spread around that they're creating good drugs. I, I, I think that someone who um, wants to go to an asteroid and they're spending all the time and all the effort doing all the science to get there, and all the engineering, of course, too. The, the, the question we're asking ourselves, and we have an answer, by the way, and this is an interesting question. Whose property is that? Is, is, it, is it the world's? Is it simply theirs? Because they're investing the time and effort to go there. Questions we haven't answered yet, but we're, you're, you're asking the right question. I, I have my own views on it. I don't want to 
go too far on that. It's much to say that I, I, I think it's a, it's, it's an exciting, it's exciting that we can even think about this. And I think it's going to be generally the way the law of the seas work, which is um, space is, is for all humankind. However, if you find something in the bottom there and you spend the time and effort, it's yours to take. And, and it's roughly, I think that's what we're going to use as a model, generally a known model throughout the world. Can I refocus the question and then what about the general public? Or like, where's my tank? I'm mm -hmm. excited about the future, I'm excited about new space, but what am I going to get out of this? So science, the advancement of science and technology, but for the general public, keeping them excited and engaged, how do you do that? For the common man. Uh, I can just say, Apophis is coming. It could destroy the Earth. I think we better take a look at that. <laughs> you know? I know, and by the way, so in Milo, we always have this image of like, we're going to go there first, and by mistake, we're going to crash into it. It's going to like knock it really close to the Earth, and then we already have different homes set up. Just to get the <laughs> yeah, there, there is that risk, but Papas is not going to hit us. Just, <laughs> it's <laughs> not, not breaking news. Um, but, but in general, you know, we, we actually have thought at NASA you know, a lot about this. You know, what are the, what are the you know, spin-offs of, of, of NASA, and, and frankly, um, you know, those are good ancillary benefits, but they can't really be predicted, right? You can't predict, oh, I'm gonna get this great technology breakthrough as a result of this. Now you can look back in hindsight and say, oh, space program, look at all these things. And so if you're gonna build a, you know, economy out of that or like a program out of that, we're gonna get these benefits here, here, and here from this space program, we can't predict it, but it's gonna occur. You know, technology development is necessary for these new space missions, period in story. You're gonna push things farther than you ever had before. I mean, the benefits are going to be there. You just can't really say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do my crystal ball here and show, show you what's coming. Um, and you can't really build that into the model because you, you, if you take an economic you know, cost you know, benefit analysis, you can't really put that together that way. But there are, the, the, the overarching theme of all the benefits together, I think, tell you the, tell you the overall story. And, and we'll get things, you know, even though Tang's a little bit of a misnomer, but I mean, you'll get, you'll get things out of the program that they'll benefit you. See, yeah, that's what I was going to touch on with Ryan said, you know, the Apollo program. Um, everybody, I think, in this room probably has some type of cordless tool in their garage or in their home. That came out of the Apollo program because we had to be able to have cordless tools on the surface of the moon. We couldn't haul a bunch of generators up there and produce the energy. We had to develop battery technology. And look where it's gone today. We couldn't have predicted that back then. Um, and I agree with Ryan. We're going to have development come out of this. Commercial companies will develop technologies, and it will be intellectual property of theirs not the governments. Um, that's where kind of where I'll talk about clips again. There will be payloads that fly there where people are going to develop their own technologies um, and be able to then uh, put maybe bring it to market uh, and sell for a profit, right? And it won't be NASA's, it'll be purely there. Um, I can envision um, advanced power generation systems that could be developed small, compact, low mass for us to take to the surface of the moon, eventually to Mars potentially could be used back here on Earth. You know, we've got generators now that we hook up for, you know, bad weather. I lived in Florida for 28 years. You had a generator, because if you live there, Florida Power and Light, which we used to call Florida Flash and Flicker, um, <laughs> every thunderstorm that came through, which four o'clock every day, um, you know, you tend to lose power, and particularly tropical storms and so forth like that that affect other areas of the country. But um, you want smaller, compact um, generator systems that maybe can last longer that don't have to necessarily rely on uh, diesel fuel or propane gas. You know, we're going to be developing, there are, I didn't have a list up there, but one of the payloads we're going to be flying on one of those early clips missions, advanced solar cell technology. There is a, um, a principal investigator that's testing out to, uh, new solar technology to improve the efficiency of solar cells. I could certainly see where that eventually, if it comes to market, could be better solar panels, better solar power use here on Earth, uh, not just in space. So yeah, I, I think that it's really wide open. It'll be really interesting to see. One last part of that, though, is interesting. Back during the shuttle days, um, there was a payload that I was involved with that flew, and it was sponsored by Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Some of you might remember that. And there were tests done on orbit on which was better. That data was never released. NASA didn't get that data. It was secured and delivered to Coca-Cola and Pepsi. To this day, I don't know which one was better. 
or not, but um, I expect those will be the mark, you know, same thing for flying commercial payloads uh, in deep space as well. I know Juan has to catch his flight. We have two questions, so we go to you and then so um, just a question to the human element of longer, more sustainable trips um, off the planet. Um, understanding that, from my understanding, that takes a toll on a human body being off planet, um, you know, out of gravity. And you're obviously expecting to astronauts to spend longer times off planet. Now, is that factored into the sustainability of your project? Or are you planning to fly out consistent numbers of astronauts off the Earth? And do we have that? astronaut capacity or capability to do that? So we are continuing to do tests on the International Space Station on just what you're asking about, uh, human performance um, and health. Um, and we've been learning quite a bit about sustained um, presence in uh, zero G, right? Um, we're gonna be continuing to do those kinds of tests. Yes, we're factoring that into the long sustainability plans on how to mitigate some of the effects we've seen on zero G, how to keep the crews healthy, uh, and be able to perform um, and being in deep space for longer periods. Um, more testing is going to be required, um, and as we learn more, we'll be able to, to better prepare the crews for the longer duration spaceflight. Um, but um, I can tell you that yeah, it's very much in active right now. And, you know, we mentioned some of the uh, Mars analogs we can do on the surface of the moon. Uh, we're already looking at, you know, doing those types of tests where we do long term duration planning before we go to Mars, where you could potentially have crews in lunar orbit on the gateway for long periods, send them down, down to the surface of the moon, uh, do their EVAs, their extravehicular activities, and then go back up to gateway. So we're looking at all kinds of different options there to um, ensure that we're, we best prepare the crews for those long duration uh, deep space flights. Yeah, your question's a really good one. Um, you know, Mars missions are gonna take years, potentially, to do. So we need to be able to have a good standing of that. Um, one, one aspect of that I just want to add is radiation. Uh, it's a big issue. Um, and LEO, low Earth orbit, um, this is getting a little technical for everyone, but we are, we are sheltered from a lot of the radiation. And so in ISS, um, we don't have the same analogs that we have on a deep space mission. And so we're going to have to spend some time learning how the body reacts to radiation, both the deep space kind um, and then also so, so it's, it's something called um, solar particle emission, so, so sun radiation as well as deep space radiation that just comes from galactic cosmic rays. So those things need to be understood better, mitigation strategies for that need to be understood. Um, it's a great place to do it is on the moon. So that's what we'll be, you know, be pushing for is these tests with humans. Now, we don't want guinea pig humans, right? We want to learn along the way and then once we understand it well enough, the risks, the mitigation strategies, then we'll do the, the deep space mission to Mars. Your question, sir. I'm going to use a nasty term in a moment, but we have half a dozen we have half a dozen countries that are lunar capable. We have in this room two different groups representing private and government to talk about lunar. There's a nasty thing called space traffic management. Uh, we have stuff going up and down from the moon, gateway or whatever. Who is responsible, what coordinations, and what processes need to be put in place down the road to avoid the same problems that we developed globally Sure. So um, let's start by saying that we don't have STM quite solved here yet um, with regard to, to uh, traffic back and forth to Leo and Geo and et cetera. And it is an issue. Um, the, the, a lot of the issue that actually we've been trying to work right now is who is exactly what you asked, which is who is responsible, right? And there's still quite a bit of discussion about that um, politically in terms of who is responsible. From a technical point of view, the issue really is how do you get data, how do you get data in time, how do you get data in such a way that you can aggregate that data, integrate that data, make predictions, okay, and essentially generate assessments, okay, that then are fed back to operators in such a way that they can avoid um, the kinds of things that we'd like to avoid, okay, like, like collisions. Um, with regard to the moon, we are a ways away, to put it mildly, um, from having a transportation um, zigzag up there like we do, like we're beginning to develop here. Um, it, it, the transportation model, for example, just to keep humans on the surface um, is one that's, there's various permutations of it um, and also having to do with sort of orbital interests. 
which are not just like gateway, but also science, okay, um, in, 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 in lunar orbit. And right now, that stuff's really pretty well understood. So my answer to you would be, I would really like to see us get this sorted here. <laughs> uh, we've made a lot of progress on it. Uh, and I think we need to sort of finish that, right? You know, close that up. And then as we implement what it is that we're doing here um, in a more cohesive way, I think we'll learn things that we can then apply um, as we go forward. But it really is going to be quite a while before we're struggling with that kind of a problem. In there. And I'm not, saying, I'm not saying ignore it, okay? I love forward thinkers, but it is going to be a while. And, uh, I'm going to respond and then run. Um, <laughs> so you can't put anything on it. Um, <laughs> we already have a regime worldwide. Well, first of all, let me say, as I pointed out to you, I'm about to get on a plane. I'm going to sleep on that plane because I know it's going to be absolutely safe going over there because the world figured out a regime where we make um, each country responsible for their carriers. Now, the regime exists today. We have essentially the International Telecommunication Union, at least for satellites and all that, and of course the United Nations. The, the issue may be enforcement, and that's maybe what you're really asking, is how do we enforce that everyone abides by these rules? At the Federal Communications Commission, at least when it comes to the satellites, they did deal with orbital debris. They are forcing that anyone who sends something up there, you better be able to make sure that it goes either, you know, burns to the atmosphere or gets up um, higher, higher so it's not getting into trouble. With regard to the moon, we're ways away before we junk it up. But, you know, we seem to have that ability wherever we go to, to, to you know, junk things up until we don't. And then we have rules and regulations. But the reality is, again, going back to the, mar uh, the maritime point, we have regimes on how to act as world citizens and be part of the world. And we have, and, and space is going to be no different when it comes to human beings trying to solve problems where we don't collide with one another, we don't get on top of one another, at least to the point where we both can coexist and exploit it as we wish. Or do the science. And I don't mean exploiting in a bad way, I mean in a good way. So I, I think the regime exists. I think we need to come up with better enforcement mechanisms, which we will, like the worldwide um, organization. But you know, the United States tends to be one of the enforcers worldwide, and I'm sure we will be going forward in the future. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lon, Ryan, and Steve. Thank you for your expertise, and thank you for bringing us all together. Stay dry out there. Thank you.